let's talk more about finding and classifying relative extrema because the classifying part isn't so bad. The finding part can be a bit challenging. Um, let's look at some examples. Let's say we have f of x comma y equal to x cubed minus 3xy plus y squared plus so whenever we're doing this, we're always going to start by just finding the critical values. So we find the critical values, or I should I should really say critical points because it's not just a value, it's an xy pair that make up the critical point. So to find the critical points, we're going to take the partial derivatives and them equal to zero. Your professor might have said we're, we're taking the gradient and setting it equal to zero. They might not have said that. If they haven't said that, it's fine. Okay. Um, we, I think we talked about the gradient at some point. The, the, all the gradient is, if we do talk about it, it's just a vector where each component is just each partial derivative. But if we don't, I, we might not go there. I feel like we usually talk about it with directional derivatives, but we'll see. Maybe that's, so it's, it's, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I get mixed up about which classes cover which content. So we might not actually talk about that. So we're going to take, why am I writing the wrong symbol now? Sorry. We're going to take our partial with respect to X which is 3x squared minus 3y plus 0. We're going to set that equal to 0. And similarly, we have partial check to y, which is going to be negative 3x plus 2y, set that equal to 0. And then we kind of have to make choices. Um, unlike the last example we did last class, None of these have just numerical solutions right off the bat, right? Like there isn't an X equal to two or a Y equal to five. To have a solution, like for example, I'm just going to point out that one solution to the second equation, it would be X equal to two and Y equal to three. Now I want to be super clear. I'm not saying that's a critical point. I'm just saying that it's a solution to this equation being zero. Is it also a solution to this equation being zero? No, it's not. If you plug in two for X and three for Y, you get three times four minus nine, which is not zero. So two, three is not a critical point, but it is a solution to FY equal to zero. But when there aren't any obvious solutions you can get by just factoring stuff, we have to take one of the equations, isolate a variable, and then plug it into the other equation. It doesn't really matter what you pick, but I try to pick the easier thing. Mm, to me, I don't want to deal with fractions. So I'm actually going to look at the first equation here and say, okay, I'm going to use this equation and say that 3x squared is equal to 3 times y, and then x squared is equal to y, or y is equal to x squared. So I'm going to take that y equal to x squared and plug it in for the y in the other equation. So now that second equation is going to be negative 3x plus 2 times x squared equal to 0. And then we can factor out an x. I'd probably rewrite it as 2x squared minus 3x equal to 0, just because that feels more natural. And then factor out an x and write it as 2x minus 3 equal to 0. So our candidates for half of a critical point are either x equal to 0 or x equal to 3 halves. And then to find the corresponding y coordinate, well, we know that y has to equal x squared. So if x equals zero, we're going to get y equal to zero. So our critical point is going to be zero, zero. And if x is equal to three halves, we're going to get y equal to three halves squared, which is nine fourths. So those are our two critical points, zero, zero. And three halves comma nine fourths. The second part is the classification. So now we're going to find that big capital D thing and we're going to plug in each of these points to figure out what we've got. So let's find capital D. And I'm really just going to look at these two things here. So I know that capital D is FXX. It's FYY minus FXY quantity squared. 
this for this function our fx if we're looking at fx fx is 3x squared minus 3y so fx x is going to be 6x fyy is going to be 2 and fxy is going to be the derivative of this with respect to y so it's going to be negative 3. You could also double check and make sure that fy x gives you the same thing for like fy the partial derivative with respect to x is also negative 3 so that's good that it looks like we're doing things the right way. So there's our capital D. And as tempting as it might be to simplify this, I really don't think you want to simplify this. So now we're just going to check each critical point. So the critical point zero, zero, when we plug it in, D of zero, zero is going to be six times zero times two, zero minus nine, which is negative. And when D is negative, that means we have a sap at the critical point zero, zero. And you're always gonna saddle if D is negative. So the other critical point, which was three halves comma nine fourths. So I plug that in, we're gonna get, let's see, Plugging in three halves for x. There is nowhere to plug in the nine fourths for y, which is fine. We're going to get six times three halves times two minus negative three squared is nine. Let's see, six times three halves is 18 over two, which is nine times two is 18. So we get 18 minus nine, which is positive. So if d is positive, that means you have to do one more thing. So D being positive means you either have a minimum or a maximum. To figure out what it is, we look at either one of the second partial derivatives, either what fxx was or what fyy was. And notably here, they're both positive. And I really, I really like to think of it as what the concavity is doing. So if the second derivative is, is positive, that means which way is the concavity? Is it up or is it down? Concave, up. Which we'll talk about one more in, in another second. So if we're concave up, that means that we have a minimum, right? Because if we're concave up, so fxx being positive means we're concave up, which looks like an upward opening parabola, which means we have a minimum. So in this case, we have a minimum. So we have a minimum at the point three halves comma nine fourths. Um, the way I kind of think about, so just to kind of expand on this concavity idea for one more moment, the two ideas I keep in my mind when I think about that is really just the function f of x equal to x squared or negative x squared. f of x equal to x squared is your usual upward opening parabola, which is for sure concave up. And if you take its second derivative, well, the first derivative is 2x. The second derivative is 2, is two which is positive. So if the second derivative is positive, we correlate that to being concave up. And if your function is concave up at a critical point, it's got to have a minimum there. And then in a similar way, you could say that f of x equal to negative x squared is concave down. It looks like a downward opening parabola. Its derivative is negative 2x. Its second derivative is negative 2, which is negative. So when the function is concave down, has a negative second derivative. And the reason I like to say this is because when I'm trying to remember what happens when my D is positive, I really don't want to have to memorize the fact that, okay, if D is positive, if FXX is negative, that means we have a maximum. If FXX is positive, that means we have a minimum. I would much rather correlate the things that have meaning to me. Like, oh yeah, if FXX is positive, that means it's concave up. And if it's concave up, we have to have a minimum. Similarly, if FXX is negative, it's concave down, we have to have a max. And again, we only look for this when your D is positive. Because if D is negative, we know that we have a minimum. So 
Would we actually have when we use negative? I said the wrong thing. If you use negative, we should have a sign. Sorry, I said the wrong thing there. So when D is negative, we have a map. Holy smokes. When D is negative, we have a saddle. When D is positive, we can either have a minimum or a maximum. And we check the second partial derivative to see which thing it is. Well, that's an excellent question. So I want to, so when D is positive, it's always true that fxx and fyy have to have the same sign. Because you know, look how we calculate D. So if this is positive, well, fxy squared is always positive. So you have something minus something that's positive. The only way for this whole thing to turn out positive is if this part here is a bigger positive number. And for fxx times fyy to be a bigger positive number, they have to have the same signs. Now I'll point out if f if d is negative, fxx and fyy can still have the same signs, but we don't really care. Yeah, good question. People always ask that. They're like, oh, but what, why do we only take this one and that one? Because they're always the same if it's positive. So here, honestly, if I was doing this, I would have just looked at fyy being two and be like, oh, well, fyy is always positive. So if we have a max or a min, it has to be a minimum because everything we have is going to be conquered up. Cool. Let's look at more examples. So let's say we have the following. Well, let me make sure I didn't, let me, let me check real quick. I also want to make sure I didn't the same way I did at the end of last class. Cool, all right. So let's look at this one. Let's look at f of x comma y equal to x cubed plus y cubed minus 3x squared minus 3y squared minus 9x. Looks kind of gnarly. All right, I want all of you to start off by just finding the partials with respect to x and with respect to y. So go ahead and do that. It shouldn't take very long. They should be almost the same as each other, except things we switched. For fx, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The derivative of y cubed is 0. The derivative of 3x squared is 6x. And the derivative of negative 9x is negative 9. We're going to set that equal to 0. For fy, similar-ish, except we don't end up getting the negative 9 there. So it's 3y squared minus 6y. To me, it looks like it might be easier to deal with the second equation first. Actually, I mean, really, to be honest here, I'm gonna have to deal with each of them on their own because each equation only has one variable. So solving the second one first, I'm gonna factor out a y, a three y actually, and get three y times y minus two equals zero. So either I'm gonna get y equal to zero or y equal to two. For this equation up here, I'm gonna start by factoring out a three. If I do that, I'm going to have 3 times x squared minus 2x minus 3 equals 0. And then I'm going to factor that, if I can, which I can, the fact is that x minus 3 times x plus 1. So here I end up with two potential x values as well. Okay, so now here's an interesting question. How many critical points do I have? Yeah, and it's not, and, and to be clear, it's unfortunate that two plus two and two times two are the same thing here. It's not because I have two here plus two here. It's because I have two here times two here because each of the critical X values is getting, it's, it's paired with each of the Y values. So our critical points are gonna be three comma zero, three comma two, negative one comma zero, and negative one comma two. 
then we're going to try and do this in a somewhat systematic way here. Let's calculate D. So D is going to be FXX, which is going to be 6X minus 6 times FYY, which is going to be 6Y minus 6 times FXY, which is, or sorry, not times, minus FXY squared, which is 0 squared. So it looks like it might end up being impossible to have any saddle points here. Because this, oh, no, I take that back. I'm sorry. That's that's a whole giant lie. I was thinking about something that was going to happen. It's not going to happen. So let's start plugging in. So some of you would like to make a little table here. Like if we plug in our critical point, say that, and then we can calculate what D is going to be. So let's see. So let's start with three, zero. So plug in the point three comma zero. D is going to be, so if I plug in 3 for X, it's going to be 18 minus 6. If I plug in 0 for Y, it's going to be times 0 minus 6. And again, I'm really, really not focusing on the actual numerical value. I don't care what 12 minus times negative 6 is equal to. I just care that it's negative. So here it's going to be negative, and that means we're going to have a saddle. Conclusion, 3, 0 is a saddle point. Look at the next critical point. So we do three comma two. So three comma two, again, we're gonna get 18 minus six for the first factor, and we're gonna get 12 minus six for the second factor. And that's gonna be positive, because it's a positive times a positive. And then we know that we have to look at the partial, each of the second partials, or one of the second partials. So notably here, both FXX and FYY are positive, so we see that fxx is positive, which means we are concave up, which means we have a, a minimum at the point three comma two. And then we keep going. We plug in the next one, negative one comma zero. We get negative six minus six. We get zero minus six. A negative times a negative is positive. So we know that we have a max or a min. We check our critical, I'm sorry, our second derivative. And we, we see here that our second derivatives are both negative, meaning that we're going to have concave downness, which means we have a maximum at the point negative point zero. Then finally, the last one. Negative one comma two, we're going to get negative six minus six times 12 minus six, which is going to be negative because the negative times a positive. That means we have a saddle point. So negative one comma two is a saddle. So questions about either of these examples? As far as what's going on. The process tends to start to feel a little repetitive. Um, there's a couple of, so there's a, let's do like one or two more of these just because there's a couple more things that can happen. So sometimes you'll get X's and Y's like this. We have to kind of mix and match them. Sometimes you'll get like this equation can either be X equals this or Y equals this and you plug that into the other equation. Sometimes you just have to like so isolate Y in terms of X and plug it into the other equation. Question. Mm -hmm. It's greater than zero. Mm -mm, I did not. I said less than zero. Yeah. Right? Negative six minus six is negative twelve, which is less than zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm saying so I'm saying so I'm saying the entire product is positive, greater than zero. But I'm saying that each of those individual partial second partial derivatives is negative, and that's what's leading me to have a maximum. So I'm using this part here to say that fxx is negative. Just like I'm using this part here to say that fxx is positive. Um, also mm -hmm. I wouldn't say so. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say so. Well, let, let, let's let's take a look at what this one looks like just to kind of see what like 
it is fairly complicated. So usually we're only really graphing three-dimensional surfaces if they're kind of like the typical ones. Um, but if you want to see, I mean, I think this graph is neat. here so if we were to graph yeah okay great z equal to x cubed plus y cubed minus 3x squared minus 3y squared um, minus 9x it's pretty funky um, you can kind of see, so you can see a saddle point there. You can see a relative maximum there. If we zoom out a bit, out a bit, James. Somewhere there's a minimum. I don't see it though. Oh, that's the wrong way. Anyway, you can see some of the things, right? There's your relative maximum at the point negative one, zero. We have a saddle over here at what's looking like something like three comma zero, probably. Yeah. So yeah, but right, like I, there's no way anyone's gonna expect you to graph that surface. Like it's just, it's too complicated to do by hand. Really. Yes, yes, no. I don't need to see those changes. All right, let's look at a couple more just because there's at least one more thing I want you to see and then we will well, yeah, then we'll do some applications on things. So let's say we have the following. Yes, yeah, one's a good one. Three, we have f of x comma y equal to x squared plus four xy plus two y to the fourth. And again, we're gonna find and classify critical points. Taking our partial derivatives. With respect to x, we get 2x plus 4y, except that equal to zero. And for fy, it's a little bit more. It's going to be 4x plus 8y to the third. Okay. So up to me, I'm going to solve. I'm so again, this is one where you can't really just like find the values. You have to find one variable in terms of the other. I would not prefer to have fractions come up if I can help it. So I would either solve for x in terms of y here, you know, like 2x equals negative 4y, x equals negative 2y, and plug that in there. Or I could have done the same thing here. I could have said 4x equals negative 8y cubed, x equals negative 2y cubed, and then plug that back in over here. But either way, it seems like it's easier to solve for x in terms of y. So plugging this in for x right there, we're going to get 4 times negative 2y plus 8y cubed equal to 0. And then we're going to try to simplify this a bit. We have 8y cubed minus 8y, 0. I'm factoring out an 8y. I'm left with a y squared minus 1. That does factor even further as y minus 1 times y plus 1. So let's say we've got three potential solutions. We've got y equal to zero, y equal to one, y equal to negative one. And so then if we plug any one of those back into this equation, x equal to negative two y, our critical points are gonna be, well, if y is zero, x is zero. If y is one, x is negative two, be sure to write in the right order, that's gonna be a negative two comma one. And if y is negative one, x is gonna be positive two. So those are critical points. So then we start finding D. In this case, D is gonna be, so FXX is gonna be two. So just as a quick observation here, since FXX is always positive, it means if we have a max or a min, it's gonna to have to be a minimum because our second derivative is positive and it's concave up. Um, and then FYY is 24Y squared minus FXY, which is looking like it's going to be 4 squared. So, 
fxx, there's our fxy, sorry, fyy, and there's our fxy. Sorry. All right, and then we start plugging things in. So d of zero comma zero is gonna be zero minus 16, which is negative. So we get a saddle at zero, zero. And then we plug in two, uh, negative two, one. So we're gonna get two times 24 times one squared, minus 16. That looks like it's gonna be positive which means we know we have a minimum because our fxx is positive. Minimum at negative two, one, because fxx is positive. I would imagine we're gonna get the same result for the next point, but let's check. Plug in two, negative one. We have two times 24 times negative one squared, minus 16, still gonna be greater than zero. We still have a minimum because our second derivative is still a positive. I'll point out, right, FYY is also positive here because 24 times negative one squared is positive 24. You can't have a max or a min without FXX and FYY having the same sign. I was looking for a certain problem. I don't think I have it. It's too bad. This Um, let me ask. I should have asked you at the beginning. Did you guys talk about this in class today? Yeah. Yeah. Did you do any applications? No. Okay. You just got to... Okay. Finally, I mean, I don't think it's too terrible. But again, I, I guess my I should always say it does. It's not that bad having done it for you know twenty years. It's not that bad if you've done it for twenty years. It does take practice. Right, there's certainly, we have to exercise care when we take these partial derivatives, make sure we're solving these equations carefully. Um, let's look at one more. So, so what I did was I plugged in x equal to negative 2y here, got my y values, and then I knew that x had to equal negative 2y. So here's what I'm really thinking is happening. If y equals 0, 1, or negative 1, then this equation is going to be 0. Fy with those y values has to be zero. But we use the fact that x has to equal negative 2y to get the to get this equation to get the solutions. So I'm really just taking each of those y values and plugging them back into the x equals negative 2y equation. So if y is zero, x has to be zero. If y is one, x has to be negative two. And if y is negative one, x has to be positive two. What I could really do, which is more work, is to plug them back into the original fx equation. And so we go up here, if y is zero, then you get two x equal to zero, which means x is zero. Or if y is one, you get two x plus four equal to zero, which means x is gonna be four divided by negative two. And you plug in negative one, y is gonna be negative four divided by negative two. So you're just making sure that both equations are simultaneously zero. We can even check, right? You plug in the zero, zero for x and y, that's for sure gonna be zero, that's for sure gonna be zero. If you plug in, negative two, one for x and y, well, negative four plus four is zero, and negative eight plus eight is zero. And similarly, if you plug in two, negative one, we have four minus four is zero, we have eight minus eight. So you're really just making sure, like when you've done it like this, you're taking solutions from one equation and then plugging them into the other equation to find the other equation, essentially. Let's, let's look at another one. Yeah, so let's look at the last one and then we'll look at, or two because she will ask you some applications. So let's look at f of x comma y equal to 6xy minus x squared y minus xy squared. And something I would point out about this one in particular, which is different than the previous ones, is this function of x and y is what I would call symmetric in the variables x and y, meaning if you were to interchange every x with y and every y with x, you'd still have the same equation, right? I'd have six times y times x minus y squared times x minus y times x squared, which is literally the same equation that we have currently. What that means is whenever you have a solution, its partner where you switch x and y is also a solution. 
So for example, if we end up getting like one comma three as a critical point, we also have to get three comma one as a critical point. You don't really need to know this. It's just kind of neat to see. It. So let's go ahead and find, like, why don't you both, you three as well, Tiffany, why don't you find the partial derivatives and set them equal to zero and see what you can see. And actually, say just find the partial derivatives because trying to solve this, there's another kind of wrinkle here that we should address. So hopefully these are the partial derivatives you found. First one, 6y minus 2xy minus y squared. Fy is 6x minus x squared minus 2xy. And these look fairly complicated. But notably, each of them have something you can factor out. So when you're trying to solve these things equal to zero, factoring is really your biggest friend. In the first one, we can certainly factor out a y, and we're left with 6 minus 2x minus y. In the second one, we can definitely factor out an x. We're left with 6 minus x minus 2y. And so now, what I would point out is to solve this system of equations, both of these equations have to equal zero at the same time, which means either this factor and this factor have to be zero. Well, that's easy. X and Y are both zero. Or this factor and that factor have to be zero. Or that factor and that factor have to be zero. Or both of those factors have to be zero. Those are the only ways this works, right? One of, In each equation, one of the factors has to be zero. So we're either going to have x equal to zero and y equal to zero. Well, great, we're done with that one. Or we're going to have x equal to zero and six minus two x minus y equal to zero. Or we're going to have y equal to zero and six minus x minus two y equal to zero. Or we're going to have six minus two x minus y equal to zero and six minus x minus two y equal to zero. Those are the only four options. And three of them are pretty not terrible to deal with because in the second one here, so first of all, in the first one, you get zero, zero. In the second one, if X is zero, you can substitute that in for X in the second equation and get that six minus Y has to equal zero, which means Y is six. So we're gonna get the point zero comma six. And the, thir the third equation, it's not gonna be surprising when we get six comma zero. If we plug in y equal to zero, we get six minus x equal to zero, which gives us x equal to six. So we get six comma zero. The fourth one is the hardest one to deal with. And it's even it's not even that terrible. So we're going to take one of these equations and isolate either x or y. So if I take this equation and isolate y, I have six minus two x equal to y. And I'm going to plug that in for y in that second equation. So I'm going to have six minus x minus two times six minus two x equal to zero, and then simplify. Six minus x minus 12 plus four x equals zero. I have a three x and six minus 12 is minus six equal to zero. So it looks like I'm gonna get x equal to two. If I plug that in over here, then y is gonna equal six minus two times two, which is also two. So our, our critical point here is the point two comma two. So here's our four critical points. And notably, every critical point and its flip pair is also a pair. So zero, zero is its own flip, two, two is its own flip, and six, zero and zero, six are the flips of each other. 
All right, now for the classifying. So, we find fxx and fyy, not too bad. fxx and fyy, it's fxy squared. That's going to be, let's see, fxx is going to be 0 minus 2y. FYY shouldn't be minus 2x, which it is. And FXY is actually a little bit more complicated. FXY is going to be 6 minus 2x minus 2y. Interesting. All right, let's do the thing. We're going to plug in each of our critical points. So D of 0, 0 is going to be 0 times 0 minus six minus zero minus zero squared. That seems like it's going to be negative. It is it's negative 36. So we get a saddle. Going to two, two next. Plug in two comma two, we're going to get negative four times negative four minus Six minus four minus four squared. Okay, we actually need to calculate this one to make sure we've got the right sign. That's going to be 16 minus, let's see, six minus four is two, minus another four is negative two squared. So that's looking like it's going to be positive. So then our fxx being negative means we're concave up. So we know we have a maximum. And then let's see, I'm guessing the other two points are going to be minimums, but I don't actually know. Let's find out. So we plug in 0, 6. We're going to get, hmm, I, it might actually be a saddle. Never mind. So we're going to get, did I say the wrong thing? I did. Oh, I, so I didn't. So I said the wrong thing here, actually. Right? Because FXX being negative means it should have been concave down. Yeah, good call. Thank you. Concave down. And then we should have a maximum of two comma two. And then third and fourthly, you plug in zero comma six, you're gonna get zero minus six minus twelve minus zero. Oh sorry, well six minus zero minus twelve square, which is certainly going to be negative. So again, a saddle. And also at six comma zero, you're gonna get zero minus six minus twelve minus zero squared, which is also gonna give us a saddle. So a lot of saddles, three saddle, that's kind of interesting. I'm kind of curious what that looks like. You should see what that looks like. I think it might look neat. Let's take a look, just kill this thing. I do think there is value in seeing what these things look like. Otherwise I wouldn't be showing them because, right. But let's take a look here. So if we graph Z equal to six X Y minus X squared Y, Minus xy squared. Oops, that's not right, James. Minus xy squared. Oh, yeah, that's cool looking. You zoom out a bit. Look at those saddles. You can see three saddle points and then one relative maximum in the middle of them all. It's kind of cool. I like it. All right. So, Seven minutes left, sure. Let's look at one sort of, um, what's what I'm looking for here? Word problem, for lack of a better word, or applications. So a lot of things we can do with these is we can use these functions of two variables to find the, kind of to optimize some sort of situation. Like, for example, the following. Let's say we have the material or constructing an open top box costs twice as much. Oh, sorry, I missed a, I missed a keyword, apologies. The material for constructing the base of an open top box costs twice as much 
as the material for the sides. Find the dimensions of the largest box that can be made for a fixed dollar amount. C. Normally in a problem like this, they would actually give you a dollar amount, like a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, whatever. But we can also do it just where we say the number of dollars is C and, we'll, and our answer will be in terms of that constant C. So let's draw ourselves a picture here. Here's our open top box. And unlike a problem like this that you might have seen in 16A or B, we didn't say the base was square which is how we usually deal with the not having enough variables. But here the base is not necessarily square. So you've got your base, which is X and Y in dimension. And then your height, which is Z. So we know that we're trying to maximize the volume, which at least currently I would write the volume as just x times y times z. And we don't have the tools to maximize the function of three variables, so we need to eliminate one variable somehow with a constraint. Our constraint is the fact that we have some cost equation. We know that the base cost, the materials cost twice as much as the side. So, well, I should say twice as much per square Right, that's fine. Let me let me do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The material for constructing the base cost twice as much as the material for the side. So, the cost for the base. Well, the area is x times y, and then we're going to double however much that area is because it's like twice as much. And then for the sides, well, the side area is going to be x times z plus y times z plus another x times z plus another y times z. So it's going to be 2xz plus 2yz. So multiply those things together, and that's going to equal our cost. So our cost is going to be 2xy plus 2xz plus 2yz. And if we had a number for cost, that's what we go right there. So like if the cost were hundred dollars, we'd say great, two x y plus two y z plus two x z is equal to hundred dollars. But we just have a constant c instead. And then we're going to take one of these variables and solve for it in terms of the other two. And sometimes it'll be obvious which one's easiest to solve for. Here it literally doesn't matter, right? You can solve for x y or z because they have the same function here. I'm going to solve for z because I like writing things in terms of x and y. It's kind of the common choice. So here we're going to take this and we're going to say, great, I'm going to say that C minus 2xy is equal to Z factored out times 2x plus 2y. So then C minus 2xy divided by 2x plus 2y is equal to C. It's looking kind of gross, but it looks kind of gross. And we're going to take that, we're going to plug that into the volume. So now the volume is just a function of x and y is going to be x times y times c minus 2xy over 2x plus 2y. Which still seems pretty awful. I'm not going to lie. It seems like less, less excellent than I was anticipating it was going to be. But totally doable. Totally doable in three minutes might be another question. So here's how I would encourage us to think of this. I'm going to think of this as V of X comma Y equal to X times Y times C minus 2XY times 2X plus 2Y to the negative one. Let's make it a little bit easier to deal with. So now we're going to take some partial derivatives. Our VX is going to be, mm, this is really kind of, 
it's probably really grosser than I thought it was going to be, but it's fine. Um, I have to use a triple product rule here. So I don't know if you've seen the triple product rule before, but basically you just take the derivative of each part and multiply by the other ones. So like for the derivative of x times y, with respect to x is going to be y times the other two parts. Plus, then you leave the other two parts alone, x times y, and then the derivative of c minus 2xy with respect to x, which is going to be negative 2y, times the other part left alone. And then finally, you leave the first two parts alone, x times y, times c minus 2xy, and then the derivative of that part is going to be negative 1 times 2x plus 2y to the negative second times 2. Doesn't change. That's pretty gross. Um, here's where we're going to make our life easier, though. I'm going to point out that this function, kind of like that one we were doing last time, if you interchange x and y, you'd solve the same thing, right? You'd have y times x, which is the same as x times y. You'd have c minus 2 times y times x, which is the same as it was. And you'd have 2y plus 2x there. Same deal. So let's go ahead and simplify this, and then we'll talk about how Vx is going to be exactly the same. And again, we'll, we won't finish this, but we'll talk about it. So I'm going to factor out a 2x plus y to the negative second. Sorry, 2x plus 2y. So 2x plus 2y to the negative second. I can also factor out a y. So I'm left with a c minus 2xy times 2x plus 2y. Because if I multiply that by that, you'd have a 2x plus 2y to the negative first. And here I'm left with an x times negative 2y times 2x plus 2y for the same reasons. And here I'm left with an x times c minus 2y times a negative 2. Because the 2x plus 2y to the negative second got factored out. Oof. All right. So then simplifying this even more, and again, we'll stop after I do this. We've got in brackets, if I, oh yeah, that's, that's a real gross problem. Two, I really don't want to do it, <laughs> but it will. Um, you got a 2xc, 2yc, minus 2x squared y, minus 2xy squared, minus a 2xy times 2x is a 4x squared y. Minus a 4xy squared Ooh. plus a 4xy minus a 2xc all times y over 2x plus 2y squared. Yeah, that's a not a great, it's that's not true. It's a good problem. It's not a good problem for right now. Um, so I might finish this up on my own and kind of present solutions to you. 